pay a certain proportion of your money to better hide your money and right. to protect it from ca and yes. to protect it from taxes. And right. so that this is right, right? Like there is this, like, I mean, that there's just kind of like a you can, you know. I think that this is actually taxes are so interesting in this regard because I was going to ask you the wonky question that I was kind of saving was like why taxes versus fines which you also see fines having this disproportionate effect on the on lower income classes um where and like and that fines end up being if you are in a world in which you are trying to understand um relational wealth uh, that a $20 fine for a parking meter or whatever means a lot more to a working class person than it does to, you know, a bajillionaire. And so there's that. And so you think the taxes, because they're proportional, should be taking account of that. And then they fail us even in that regard, uh, as you're kind of, as you're kind of like talking about this selective enforcement. So... The sure thing about the fines, I remind, I think right around the time when Michael Brown was killed, there was quite a lot reported in the news. I'm trying to think of one of the New York Times reporters who doesn't, name doesn't come to mind about because especially in the St. Louis area, all the different counties, right, that fund themselves and they fund themselves through fines. Um, so yeah. that, that, you know, a system has to pay for itself. And so, right, and it actually, we did, we do have equivalent of debtor's prison because these fines do add up. I don't, um, I don't address that in this book, but you're right. I mean, low hanging fruit, though we see this everywhere, right? With prosecutors too. It's a story and even if you don't have, um, and that's how power works, right? If you're wealthy and you're a teenager, back when marijuana was, well, well today it's still kind of a mixture, right? When it was illegal to smoke pot or to drink when you were underage, if you're wealthy, you do that in your home. And, you know, if you have a party, the way, the way I was raised, upper middle class white person from the Midwest, people had parties in their parents' houses. If it got loud, the police knocked on the door and said, turn down the music. If you didn't, turn, said, go home. I never remember anyone getting arrested for that. The only people I knew who got arrested were from my, the boarding school who, like, broke into a dry cleaner. One of the kids had a gun, but that thing went away. That charge disappeared. Um, anyway. But it's well, I want to I zoom out for a minute. Uh, we dove right into specific chapters of the book, but I want to talk about what the aggregate larger thesis of the book is. What's what's the case you're trying to make here? Um, so that's a good question. I guess I'm making um, I'm making you know a positive and a normative case, I suppose, and then prescription, just to say. So I try to tell the story or try to unpack what white collar crime is, because that's not even, that's a very, um, still an indecisive term and concept. Both, we don't, have, we don't have a shared understanding of what we mean by white collar crime, and there's no uniform measurement or collective measurement of it. So there's that. And to try to talk about that, I want to do the history piece. So that's the positive part. Um, the normative part, which I think is what you're asking about, is what is the argument I'm making? And essentially, um, I'm making the argument that we have had periods in our history where we've cracked down on corporate and white collar crime. And it's essential to do that as and, and that it follows a particular pattern where there's some kind of disaster or meltdown. And usually there's helping the victims, some sort of regulatory or congressional response, and there's some piece of punishment. And you cannot leave out the punishment because what, what that means is it creates the incentive. Well, those very people who aren't punished can go on and do things. But it also creates um, a sense that there is no rule of law, mistrust in our government and business institutions, and creates an incentive for people just to harm others. So I guess the thesis is, it's important to hold white color criminals and corporations that commit crimes accountable or we will end up harming more people and also creating this uber wealthy, uber powerful class of people. So, you know, again, one of the, th one of the themes in the book, although it's sort of underlying it all, is that if Donald Trump had been held accountable over the many decades of the um, offenses he committed that were treated as civil offenses and settlements with the SEC, with all these regulators, 
if he'd actually been held accountable in a criminal sense, I think he would have served time in federal prison instead of the Oval Office. And he's not the only one. So I, I guess that's my thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to this um, for a lot of reasons. I'm also cognizant of the fact that it cuts against the grain of a lot of sort of modern suspicions of the criminal justice system. And granted, the criminal justice system, the suspicions are raised in other contexts, um, but they are, you know, generally speaking, against incarceration, against um, uh, a, a, a retributive components to the criminal justice apparatus. Um, and they are generally of the argument that the uh, way the system deals with uh, street crime, particularly with respect to people of color, should look more like the way it handles white collar crime. That is, dealing with things in civil contexts, figuring out uh, how to uh, figure out alternative uh, uh, pathways to justice rather than prosecution, Absolutely. and also flat out overlooking some things. Um, and, um, and I'm curious whether you're self-consciously making, hey, the criminal justice reform as we normally talk about it should make justice as to uh, street crime look more like justice as to white collar crime and white collar crime justice should look more like street crime justice or whether you're whether you're actually cutting against the the grain of contemporary suspicions of the criminal justice. Bravo, Ben. That was like my exact question. That's like so good. You know, when I first, you know, when you pitch a book to a trade publisher, you've got to go around and talk talk about it. And the reason why I love my editor at Viking is we had this conversation, like right in her office. And she got that this is very, it's a complicated question. Just to answer it as directly as I can, yes, um, to the extent, you know, some people worry what would happen if we have prison abolition. I'm like, it's what we do with white collar criminals for the most part. No, but I mean, I do think that there are certain categories of offenses, criminal offenses that should not be handled, handled at the federal level for the most part. Most of the white color crime cases I'm interested in are at the federal level. Secondly, I think that um, I I talk about this a bit. Um, I was concerned a couple years ago with the decriminalization effort when it was being hijacked by the Heritage Foundation or holding hands with, what we want to say, and the Koch brothers. They had this, they were on this path to, to do what they called mens rea reform. But we've been for 30 years trying to deal with the sense of um, mandatory minimums and over criminalization of drugs and treating crack and powder and cocaine differently. All this stuff that for years has been a problem. And that, the, the, you know, uh, libertarians hijacked some of that process. They didn't win. And they were going to try to take all of the federal criminal statutes and raise the um, level of intent that you would need to prove which would have eviscerated so, ma so many of them. Um, I, I don't need to go through each statute, but if you look at how even mail fraud is worded, they would get rid of the responsible corporate officer doctrine, et cetera, et cetera. So there's like a lot of problems with that. So I don't like the idea of powerful white collar criminal bar saying us too. And they often use the us too by saying, it's going to be the fishermen, Yates. You know, the whole story about Yates throwing the fish overboard. Right, that we're gonna. The danger is any statute can be used against the weak, just as much the powerful. So what I'm arguing for in this book is that we return, we use the lens Edwin Sutherland did for white collar crime, and actually care about money, class, and power. And for white collar crime, we don't collect any data about the race, the class, the net worth of the people committing the crimes. And the same thing with if I look at street crime, I'm mostly concerned about incarcerating the most dangerous people who are physically violent to others. Unless I thought there was a rehabilitation system, um, and that also might be some sort of, um, you know, mental health. So, disability. But on the white collar crime side, if you don't put people, take someone's liberty away, who's doing something extremely bad, let's say the people involved in getting people addicted to opioids, all they're going to do is reoffend like they did again. If you look at Purdue Pharma, it's just a cost of doing business. And it's only the threat of taking away someone's liberty that I believe would create the incentives 
for people who make a lot of money. Because it, what we have turned our white collar crime laws into then is speeding. And everyone, I always ask my students, who here has never exceeded the speed limit? Have you ever exceeded the speed limit, Ben? Many times. We all have. Not when, me, I'm perfect. Right, but when you do it, you do the calculation of thinking, well, it might not, I'm in a hurry. I know this isn't safe, but I think I'm a safe driver. And the worst thing that happens is I get pulled over and what, you're white, so you'll talk yourself out of the ticket or you'll contest the ticket or you'll pay it and your insurance rates go up. Go up. If getting caught speeding resulted in you being disbarred and never being able to get a job again, no one would exceed the speed limit. And that is the same thing, I think, for a lot of these laws that we put in place so people don't get hurt. Okay, but you just said the op no like not to like not to like oh. kind of drill down to here, but you said a little bit the opposite. You said that you thought that the importance of like of like non white collar crime and enforcement was in I'm going to use some legal terms here, but like in in specific deterrence and taking dangerous people off the street and deterring them from like committing crimes that might hurt other people in the future. And that's where you see well, that like the concern. rehabilitating them. So not the jails we have now. Right. So there's specific deterrence plus rehabilitation. Like, I think that that's fair. And like, but what you're saying here is you're trying to carry the same thing forward with specific deterrence and basic, or you were trying to create a generalized deterrence. I think you think, you think a general deterrence because you think that basically, sorry, for people, for people that are unfamiliar, just really quickly, specific deterrence is the idea that like, I lock up Jen because I'm afraid Jen's going to commit like 10 more homicides or I lock, and then general deterrence is like, I lock up Jen as an example to everyone else so that they know not to commit homicides anymore. And there are obviously overlapping elements of these things when you do, when you lock up any one person, but you're, you're specific, we're kind of drilling into like what it, it takes to kind of do this type of white collar crime. I want to like go to this one aspect that I'm kind of hearing come out of this and see if this is right or if I'm like misunderstanding, which is that like a little bit what I hear you saying is that there is a wealth redistribution value in in this being more strictly enforced at the highest levels of of like of wealth income and like that the, if you actually enforce some of these mechanisms for white collar crime that are in place as criminal activity, you will create sp uh, specific and general deterrence that basically has the end effects of turning, like of turning the people in the top 1%, top 5% away from trying to commit these kind of what they see as like, I'm going 72 in a 65. And they'd stop going 72 and a 65. And that's, that difference of seven would end up being like redistributed like or, more accurately. Or even more specifically, though, when I think of the specific deterrence, I'm not just talking. I think there are some people who are not reformable. There's nothing, you know, people made the mistake of thinking Donald Trump was going to grow into the presidency. As someone who studied white collar criminals for years, including the savings and loan crisis, you can spot him. He is, was not going to change. He told people he wasn't. We knew who he was. He was a con artist. That's who he is. And so the benefit of holding someone like that who is irredeemable accountable is that hopefully there's something on their record. You take away some of their liberty for a period of time and some of their money. And it makes them not able to hold positions of authority inside of large businesses, like they're banned for, barred for life from being a chairman or CEO of a public company, and maybe then they would not be running for office because of a record like that. So it's, it's, it's not just, I'm not sure, it's a weird kind of specific deterrence, right? It's also a public benefit to say this, it's the- um, It's creating criminals out of the people who have been exempt. And like, you're basically finally seeing them as that instead of making this like class-based or race-based or money-based exemption. It's, it's like, it's showing their work. It's showing that they're criminals just like the rest of us. And so if they want to run for office, they should have to run for office in the same way that someone who robs a bank should run for office. Right. So I have no problem with the premise that we should be more aggressive with respect to white collar crime. Um, I, I do worry that if you view it as a redistributive mechanism, um, 
you end up with a kind of reverse Ferguson effect that you have an incentive just as the police department in Ferguson is monetizing fines, mm -hmm. right? You have an incentive to monetize prosecutions, which creates anti-justice incentives vis-a-vis -vis, uh, margin, marginal cases or even cases that you're basically enticing the crime in exactly the same way that police departments misuse asset forfeiture, misuse uh, um, uh, various civil fines. Does that worry you or do you think we are so far on the other end that if we incentivize a certain amount of prosecution, uh, we're not going to end up with bad cases. We're going to end up with, 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 with a smaller deficit of, of good cases. I think we would have a smaller deficit of good cases. And you look back at the, I mean, the, the, the real break in the cycle that I talk about in the book was after the 2008 financial crisis. And you have people like Ben Bernanke even saying, and maybe even Greenspan, I think said, yeah, maybe people should have gone to jail. You know, other countries they did. And we had one, one guy. In terms of, I'm very worried, though, about creating the wrong incentives for prosecution, right? Because one of the things that we saw, uh, we see in, kle in, in kleptocracies, and one of my books I adore is Tom Burroughs' Kleptopia. Um, one of the things you saw Donald Trump doing is weaponizing and using, you know, using, and we see this in you know, Putin doing it, um, letting your oligarchs get away with it until they don't do what you want. So that's another danger, right? Like there's always a danger of um, abuse of prosecutorial discretion. There's always a danger of politicizing the Department of Justice. But that doesn't mean we should say, okay, there's a danger of politicizing it, so we should therefore not use our power even in a non-political way. Um, what I want to say, though, the thing that worries me the most is one, the chapter I have on the False Claims Act. Are you familiar with that law? Sure. Right. right. And because the False Claims Act gives, um, gives relators standing because of the key TAM provisions of it, so um, just for those of you who are not, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, we have to explain. Uh, like me, things. not lawyers. Oh, uh, you're not a lawyer. I am not a lawyer. The Key Tam Act. I'm uh, the only Ketam... lawyer here, and barely. <laughs> the... Yeah, no, other than you. So Key Tam is a 1790, I believe, era uh, statute. It's it's quite early. Uh, that allows well, 1863 is this particular. I'm th talking about the. They had them in the colonies, but I'm talking about the 1863. Um, right, but I, there's a but there's a predecessor law back that goes far. back significantly further yeah. than that, that allows individuals to assume the role of essentially private attorneys general and file actions on behalf of the government, uh, regulatory enforcement actions. Um, and to claim a share of the uh, of the recovery if they win, and so this is a um, it's a much hated law in a lot of conservative circles, but it creates a very interesting problem for conservatives because uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, Justice Scalia would say look and did say look at fractures the unitary executive, right? This is, you know, Kate Klonick claiming the role of the government. Um, on the other hand, because it was it's so old, it seems to reflect founding era intent well, in a way that is very hard for conservatives to argue with. So it's, it's a, also, it's a just, complicated you know, little law. Kate cannot just go off and pursue her lawsuit. I mean, the government can take it over and right. settle it. Right. So there's a way to get rid of her lawsuit. Um, but it was so a little more background on the recent the 1863 version, which has been um, you know updated most recently in the 80s. And then um, later, I think, you know, we've expanded whistleblowing through Dodd-Frank. So the reason why Lincoln created this law was because there were people selling shoddy uniforms to the Union Army. So much fraud that they had to distribute it, the power to enforce. And the trouble, though, with this, and it goes back to the colonies where you could, you know, turn someone in, uh, turn in for some small regulatory offense like, you know, harvesting oysters in the wrong season. And 
you know, I don't want America to become this. <laughs> <laughs> Kate's like, I'm doomed. Yeah, you don't know this, but I like, I poach oysters like a fair amount. So that's like the whole thing. But yeah, yeah. I like, yeah, we, we can and talk about it later. It. There's and like a she whole does it in the know. wrong season. Yeah. Do you really? I mean, what? I actually do have a license, but I really do. Like, it's actually like I like I totally do. And, What's like, the last four digits of your social security number? I'm kidding. <laughs> totally not telling you that over the internet. <laughs> Friends, like I've nailed my first white collar criminal here oh, on live television. I'm gonna be like the Martha Stewart of oystering. <laughs> but in, all, in all seriousness, it's not like this is theoretical, right? Um, the False Claims Act, um, which is used now the, the, in 2014, which is the high water mark, the Department of Justice recovered $5.69 billion under the law. And of that, $3 billion of it were cases that had been initiated by whistleblowers. That's no joke. And when you compare that, it was one year to when you look at like the kind of settlements that the- well, Because the, the, like a whistleblower makes the case so much easier. That's like, it makes it low hanging fruit. So like, right. isn't part of this like a story of like make the bureaucrats job easier to catch people? Yes, and that's part of, so one of my recommendations is sort of about expanding the FCA beyond where it is and trying to reconcile. We have, so we this has been like a couple years of the whistleblower, right? National security whistleblowers have one process and you are whistleblowing to a public company, it's a different process and blah, blah. It's like, it's super confusing and you can step up, you can, you know, misstep and all this stuff. So I'm, I'm planning to write a law journal article. I was supposed to do it, I told myself for the February cycle, but you know, that cycle has passed. Um, uh, but I'm talking- Welcome to my life. Yeah. Wait, did, I, did I lose you or am I still- No, waiting? no, you're still here. We're just bringing you're in people here. to We're ask you questions. To people oh, right. bring you in questions. the audience for questions. But there's, a, you know, there's, a, there's this balance. It's, it's it, you know, you don't want small potatoes cases and you also don't want the disgruntled employee or you don't want someone hired to work. You know, I worked in the corporate sector. I like businesses. I like markets. Commercial law is my favorite thing to teach. You wouldn't maybe know that, but I'm one of those sort of conservative progressives who actually want, you know, I want accountable businesses. I actually believe incentives matter. I'm a weird combination of my parents were Republicans and I'm not. And so, I, right. So I had, <laughs> not, yeah. Where are you from? I'm from Western New York. But my parents like built a house in Cape Cod, and that's where I've been for the last eleven months. So poaching what? oysters, poaching, poaching oysters. Wait, where in Cape Cod? We'll talk about it later. But like, <laughs> sorry, but in Outer Cape, in the Outer Cape, and so like it was uh, no, and so like, and they and they and they funded the entire. It, anyways, it's like very interesting, and I'm I want to say one last thing, which is like the examples that I want to kind of like to like pull out, which I, I will say that there have been like, and people have been talking about the college admissions uh -huh. uh, uh, thing. And like, and I just want to pull out the fact that like the people that, that, I mean, Bernie Madoff obviously is an example of someone that was used as like a general deterrence principle and everything else. Like it was crazy. It, there was no possible way that they could not have, but like, let's talk about the fact that things like insider trading or the college admission scandal, that the selective enforcement for like white collar criminals typically like ends up falling on like the shoulders of women and like other types of like and that there's kind of this you know there is this idea i remember specifically like thinking like i'm pretty sure like people probably do this type of thing when when like martha stewart was getting prosecuted it sounded in a way very mundane to me um well she didn't of, get charged with insider trading as you know what do you say she did not get charged with insider trading by the way Oh really? I actually didn't oh, really? know what. What is she? Oh, what is she? First day of class, it was obstruction. Oh, false statements. false statements, and I think that the several counts of those things. Yeah, the FBI <laughs> is very, very consistent about this. If you lie to the FBI, they will you. hunt you to the ends of the earth. Right, and that's and why. It, oh, yeah, it doesn't matter how rich you are. It doesn't matter what right. color you are. It is a thing that they are uh, passionate about for general deterrence purposes. Yep, and she, they, that's they, fine. They, they want people to know that when the bureau shows up at your house, no uh, line. Uh, you you have to tell them the truth. And well, to Joyce in the chat, awesome. no, if you're Flynn, they hunted him to the ends of the earth. Yeah. Bill Barr. <laughs> 
then scuttled the case. The FBI, there was like this the was a yep. classic example. He's a high, you know, a four star general serving as national security advisor. He lies got to pass. the FBI. They came after. No, he, Although, he eventually got a pass Trump. From, from Trump. Right. But not from the FBI. But not from the FBI. Yes, we not a con artist. And, you know, by the way, I had, you know, the legal vetting for the stuff I said about Trump was, I would have said more things, but it was very careful. At any rate, um, you know, if you elect a con artist to be the president, he's going to par part another con artist. Con artist. Yeah. 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 But I'm interested in your exact street address that you live at. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you that and my credit card. And like, just, you know, after the beep, we'll just kind of like, just I'll just whisper it. It'll be fine. <laughs> Alice Lee, what is your exact street address? <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. Don't just answer don't, don't that question. Anything. What's your question? That's my advice as your lawyer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, bringing up the college admission scandal it reminds me that I heard several Harvard students discussing uh, how they were going to a varsity blues party later that night sometime last year. What, why so. was the varsity blues party? What did that mean? That was the name of the... Um, well, I know it was the name of the king, but um, why were they making it a party for everyone who had cheated to get in? Or was it <laughs> I don't know. It just felt they're just, very... Just being, just like, they're just being tongue-in-cheek about it. Like, oh, yeah, wouldn't it be yeah, funny yeah, if we, like, we, the students of Harvard, acted like this wasn't this thing that we could ever be held accountable for. Yes. yes. So, um, but my real question, and I'm not sure how much you touch on international issues in your book, um, but I'm wondering how much the U.S. as like a big, with, with our banking sector, um, has control over international um, white collar crime and uh, whether, you know, it's in our, w whether we would actually do something about that given that we have interest in the amount of money that flows through. Yes. Our real estate. And so I have a chapter called Contagion of Public Corruption. And in fact, I talk a lot about money laundering and in particular the use of, um, some of this has changed now, but use of shell companies to make you know cash purchases of real estate in high-end markets. And it was a really good, I, I, I commend the, um, the work, um, the, the work to try to, um, to FinCEN, which is, I guess, and it's, I need to use that acronym, basically, um, sort of a conglomeration of uh, law enforcement efforts inside of Treasury um, has been trying to crack down on that. Um, and now we're having this new, we just had a law passed. It was slipped into maybe the um, the funding law for the military that now certain types of companies, corporation, shell company, or LLCs and others have to disclose their beneficial owners if they seem like they have no true business model. So it's going to, I think, help a little bit. But we turn out to be a money laundering mecca here in the United States. Um, you know, we're not a sh we're not the city on the hill anymore. So although so I will true. say I will say that, first of all, th this is as an enforcement matter, your your biggest bang for the buck. Um, uh, you know, money laundering, if you want to go after big themes in organized criminal activity, including yeah. from state-sponsored actors, they all have to hide their money. Um, and uh, But there's a couple important wrinkles here. The first is, if you do a serious money laundering effort, and actually the show Ozark is a beautiful representation of this, actually. That's why you and Preet love this show so much. But it was so violent. The, my students were telling me to watch it the first episode. They're so violent. It I know. Is hard I to, it agree. is hard to watch. Should I go beyond is, the first episode? It gets less bloody? Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty no, it's hard pretty to bad. watch the whole way through, actually. <laughs> but it is, okay, but it is a really good representation of money laundering. Yeah. You will end up going after a lot of little actors. Right. Because the way money launderers work is they set up, they take over genuine struggling businesses, right? So right. Right. the the uh, the strip club, the uh, you know, if you go to a, a, a pedicure manicure place, uh, there's a pretty good chance that's a money laundering front for something. I wish. May not be. I What's that? I wish I could get a mani pedi. Yeah, well, you know, 
you you can't get a good one because they're all money laundering fronts. No, I'm kidding. Um, you know, th these are um, these are big, um, and so you will end up, at least as an initial matter, not prosecuting big fish white collar crime, but doing a lot of. It's a lot like the drug trade. You have to go through a lot of mules in order to get to bigger bigger fish, and that is, you know. So they, I, I, I do want to say you couldn't just say tomorrow we're going to focus on money laundering and bring a million indictments of, of really big rich people. You would right. actually be going after a lot of little people. I also and, want to point out how much more money that's going to take in employ federal employees and federal like work to investigate. Like it does actually cost more money. Not, not money, good money laundering. Money. Good money, money laundering is really subtle and really hard to yeah. hard but to money, identify. We create our own money. I mean, read Stephanie Calvin's yeah. book. And they're not worried about money. But the IRS stuff is more e is easier in terms of bang for your buck. I agree that mo the money laundering stuff is very hard. The money try. laundering stuff is really hard, but really high impact. Yeah. The third really important point here is, yeah, we are not the shining city on the hill anymore, but we are not, uh, we're not the core of the problem right now. Yeah. And unless the UK, Canada, I'm to all our Canadian audience friends, you guys are a real problem in the money laundering department. You know, like there's a reason why nobody can afford a house in Vancouver anymore. Um, and it's Chinese money laundering operations. Um, and you in know, Ireland, Ireland uh, so. so I don't know much about Ireland. But oh yeah, the, Ireland the, is like huge London, for tech, tech laundering and tech. They're like trying to, nobody, they're changing all their tax code in order to track big tech. Nobody can afford anything in London yeah, there's anymore because it's all owned by Russian oligarchs. And I need to ask you this: Do you know if we have that? I have never heard of this in the U.S., but a student of mine who's from the U.K. They have these things called. Um, you can get an unexplained asset order against somebody. You notice that they have. Unexplained assets. So you say to instead of um, having to sue somebody for or bring a charge against them and having probable cause, you can simply say, if you're investigators, where the hell did that $5 million come from that you used to buy that? We call that forfeiture in the US. We just take no, it. But <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the technical law in yeah, the UK on that at all. But I, I, I do think I do think if we're serious about money laundering, it has to be a coordinated effort among Western European countries, the United States, everywhere where and Canada. Canada is big. There's a lot of land of high value and um, people are parking a yeah. shitload of money in it. And yeah, Chris, by the way, Chris Wright, that thing about Trump, the unexplained wealth order. They did that was what they were doing in Scotland. I think it's slightly different than forfeiture, but I don't know exactly how. And I'm really yeah. No, I was making a joke about forfeiture. No, but it's really, like, yeah. it's really but it's a good point. It's yeah. a fascinating idea that you can just go, dude. Why you just bought a Lamborghini and you work as a, as a grocer's clerk? What what's what's up? With that? You know, again, it's so, intrusive. I don't, I don't know anything. I don't I don't know about that. I just think like. I totally agree with you. Money laundering is a big, big thing, and we should really focus on it. It's got to be in a coordinated way. Yep. Or the or people will just move. David Bott, the floor is yours. Well, uh, good afternoon. Thanks so much. Uh, we've got we've got the endeavor. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. Endeavor oh, nice. David constructs his backgrounds for us. That they're like they're like a little like microcosm of the day in pictures. It's lovely. And I see um, you have you you have a uh, a Bactrian camel, a camel, um, and a, uh, which and is a excellent, and a sloth. And a, the but, the sloth is for Kate. I could not figure out how to get the the sunglasses to go up and down. So I just <laughs> gave you a sloth. Yes, my vein sloth. Yes. <laughs> Oh, wait, Baby Cannon. Oh, yeah, Baby Cannon. Oh, oh the, uh, the logo? Is, oh, this is our logo for the show. It <laughs> is, uh, is actual a, Baby Cannon. It is the actual Baby Cannon. I once rescued a baby chipmunk, and so that is the baby chipmunk lighting the Baby Cannon into a murder hornet, which was part of our news cycle for a while, and holding a baby Prosecco, so... <laughs> that's a long story. It's a long story. It's like a shield. It's like a coat of arms. There's like a lot in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, David um, Botts, what's on your mind? All right, uh, you've already answered part of this, but it can you help? Uh, two questions. One is, can you help frame the scale of white collar crime 
because it, it, it seems to me the number is much bigger than somebody holding up a liquor store, right? So that, that's question one. And then question two is much easier. Given the difficulty of putting corporations in jail, what is your suggestion for a pathway to greater accountability? Great question. So on the first one, you know, I, I wanted to know that very question myself. And unfortunately, um, there actually is no, um, there's no one who measures what we might consider white collar criminal offenses committed. There's no one who measures that, um, not even the government on a regular basis at all. And I, and I've read quite a bit and looked at the, even the, um, the data that the FBI collects, the U.S. Attorney's offices. But what I can tell you is that in America, just fraud and embezzlement um, cost victims an estimated $300 billion to $800 billion a year. Um, it's footnoted to an expert in criminology, um, and I, it, it's consistent with what I've seen elsewhere. But um, street-level property crimes, things like burglary, larceny, and theft, <laughs> Us, according to the FBI, $16 billion annually. Um, and so that's that's one thing. Um, I, if you read the book, I think you'd be particularly interested um, in the chapters called Defining White Collar Crime and also Harm Beyond Measure, because I'd be able to geek out on trying to talk about the different sources and how how to, how, how to count it and who ends up getting caught in the net. Um, uh, so your second question, though, is, um, if you can't imprison a corporate or other business entity, how do you deter things? Um, individual accountability is really important. Um, the problem you always face when you even find a corporate entity in and of itself is that the, the fees are just passed on to the shareholders. And some of them may be new shareholders who didn't benefit at all from um, the criminal activity. And so I do think individual accountability is important. It's something Sally Yates um, included in the prosecutorial guidelines when she was deputy attorney general. Um, when Rod Rosenstein became the deputy attorney general, he watered down, at least in a speech that he gave right before he resigned, it's some money laundering conference. Um, he, he watered down the emphasis on individual accountability, and I, I talk a bit about that. So I think you hold the leaders of these entities accountable, and don't let them retire with you know a hundred million dollar exit packages, and then the entities will be run properly. Um, is is what I believe. Also, most important thing is ending. Um, don't rely so much on these deferred prosecution agreements and non prosecution agreements, where these big banks, Deutsche Bank, and others keep offending again and again. Um, and, and, and there's and not only to know high level individuals, if anyone held criminally accountable, but the entity itself, they never get prosecuted and there's no real consequences. Um, in part because of the too big to fail and too big to jail phenomenon, which still exists, even though Eric Holder got lambasted for saying that and had to walk it back, he was right. And you shouldn't blame him for telling the truth. Well, Congress didn't have the power to to make banks smaller, therefore they could not have been shut down, um, it turns out. So I think this gets into, yeah, I say, you know, don't let them off the hook, hold individuals accountable, and sort of try to end some of this too big to jail if, the, if there is systemic risk associated with closing down a particular business. All right, Eric Berg, the floor is yours. For some reason, I'm unable to switch your camera on, but we should be able to hear you. Awesome. So uh, this goes back to a uh, great uh, book from a while back, but going off your book, Other People's Houses, do you think we're in a similar housing bubble as the savings and loan and 08 versions, or is this kind of a different kettle of fish? Um, you know, I don't, I don't see us in, you know, in that kind of level of, of housing bubble right now. And in part, we had a huge shock to this, to the to the we had a huge shock to the country when everything shut down because of COVID. And what's interesting is both the FHFA, led by um, I'm forgetting what his name, but Mark's last name is that the the tr one thing the Trump administration and Treasury did right is not to let this whole thing fall apart. The checks weren't big enough. 
but these moratoriums on eviction, these uh, the willingness of FHFA and, uh, and then actual bank lenders to work with homeowners meant that people didn't all um, lose their homes. And yes, I see this thing, Volcker deflation caused the SNL crisis. Yes, I talk about that in my book. I know. Thank you, Daniel. Um, but, um, <laughs> He's going to be on screen in a second. So he'll I ask think, you a question about it probably. I yeah. think the fact that Biden is willing to go really big with rescues, we put trillions of dollars into this economy. And I feel like, you know, I, I'm not seeing it, but I would I would ask, you know, Robert Schiller, you know, I would look at the Schiller's charts before I, I actually opined on that um, more. I'm more concerned about other factors in society making it collapse, um, you know, like th than I am about the housing market at this moment. Yeah. He is backlit. He is in his native habitat. He's got that grin on his face. And <laughs> Daniel Burge gets the last question today. I will throw out two questions and just take whichever one you want to answer. Um, the first is, do you think the 08 reforms did enough to reduce the chances of what Gary Gorton says is runs on repo markets, which for people that don't know what a repo is, it's a, a very short term loan. It's not a, it's um, not exactly it's not a repo, repossession, no. What is a repo market? I actually don't know that. Short term then. wholesale lending, which was the Oh, right. Oh, okay, in that context. Good. Sorry, I just taught it's repossession and the means. The Fed intervention, yeah. I just and the second. Fidelity, so yeah. Go ahead. So w the first question is Are we in a similar. Do you think the, oh, is the market. Do, uh, do you think the 08 reforms did enough to prevent runs on the repo markets? And the second question is uh, To what extent is um technical matters involved in financial crimes hindering their prosecution so the first thing is no after dodd frank was enacted i didn't think it went far enough especially for so-called shadow banking and the and, and the and the fragility of the repo market and i don't think the money market reforms went far enough and i've written about that but not in a while and then the rolling back of dodd frank wasn't all that helpful and the evisceration of local rule isn't great but yes short-term wholesale funding is the interconnection between shadow banking, as you know, in the traditional banking system. And that's where the fragility is. I used to work on the repo desk when I was a Fidelity. So I, yeah. And second question, um, now, oh, I'm already forgetting the second, what was Daniel's second question? Uh, I will read it. It is, oh, um, to what extent is prosecution of financial crimes hindered by the fact that such crimes can involve oh, quite technical matters? A lot. I mean, this is probably, yes. I mean, this is it's a lot. It, it goes to even deciding whether you're going to bring a case to a jury and whether a jury has any idea what you're talking about, improving the mental state. If you look at when the the first prosecution after the 2008 financial crisis was the uh, two hedge fund managers, which you probably know, Daniel, um, from the, those Bear Stearns hedge funds, and you know, it was a, a it was very easy to confuse jurors and they would acquit because they really, most people have not run a hedge fund or worked on Wall Street or, or do these things, right? So it's really easy to convince someone that maybe the person doing it didn't have, um, didn't do it intentionally, didn't have the requisite intent, didn't know what they were doing was unlawful. Whereas if you see someone running out of like a Best Buy, if you saw me running out of the Best Buy with a flat screen TV while the alarms are going off, you don't need my testimony or my emails to my friends saying I stole the TV if you're a juror to understand in your daily life that that sounds like I intended to steal the TV. And so it's it's the technical stuff confuses people, it bores people, and it, it and they just don't know whether it was a bad guy or a good guy. And, and they're also super hard to investigate. You know, oh, the number the number of forensic accountants FBI agents who are forensic accountants is large. Well, and what can I just say that the whole um, the uh, that guy? I know we have to go, but the um, the guy who blew the whistle on Madoff, who no one would listen to, Markopoulos. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. He had the goods. If, if anyone had paid attention to him, he was writing in all caps. I thought it was crazy. If I had been at the SEC in Boston, I would have listened to the guy because I like crazy. But people didn't. Want to, he only had to say is the volume of trading you would be having to do exceeds the volume of trading on the on the CME. I would have been like, holy shit! But okay. no one 
I, yeah. I'm, I, I'm not saying that there are no unsubtle cases, yeah. but if we're going to amp up white collar prosecution the way you're talking about, you need a lot more forensic accountants and yes. some and they, and and you need a lot a lot of good ones because a lot of these cases are subtle not not because they're not not because the intent is uh and benign, you need to pay, be, and you need to pay them you need to be well, able to uncover it who was doing a lot of the research you can sometimes be trusted and sometimes not are the shorts right the shorts are yeah. really the shorts are the biggest tell yeah for sure but they're, they're, so they're, I was at a conference that Anad and Mahdi from Stanford did. Uh, I know you have to go, but this is so cool. And it was all like law professors, um, money managers, and short sellers. Because we're also, and Jesse was there too, we're all like really negative and down on things. And I keep thinking I should just quit law and be a short seller, right? Oh, money oh and- if you want to make money, absolutely. If that's just what you're motivated by. Just don't by. short GameStop. Game. <laughs> Uh, get game stop. I actually think that you should. It, yes, it's now you bad. should. Yeah, All right. I know. <laughs> um, we're gonna leave it there. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer. Thank you guys, we it was will be so back, great to see you back Thanks. tomorrow. I think with Oren Kerr, although he has not yet confirmed. Okay, in any event, that'll be 22 hours and 54 minutes from now. And until then, Kate. We don't have fun anymore, uh, but we can short GameStop if we want to try.